I originally began writing this review in 2019 when I first played River City Guilds. I absolutely adored the game. It was a standout game for me personally back in 2019 and it continues to deliver great fun almost 3 years later. Stunning pixel art, fun, engaging combat mechanics, with a distinct location, unique bosses and a sense of humor to match. This review is an amalgamation of my original review that I never completed and the updates to the game since. I'm going to walk through the plot, game mechanics, the music, the art and all the other bits and bytes that I think make River City Gales a standout game that can easily hold its own against any other in its genre. What is River City Gales? River City Gales is a 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up game created by WayForward and published by Arc System Works. The game was originally released in September 2019. River City Gales is a spin-off game of the Kunio Kun franchise, a long-running franchise that was started all the way back on the NES in 1986 with the release of, and I apologize for pronouncing this, Neketsu Koha Kunio Kun. River City Gales, however, is billed as a canonical game in the franchise. River City Gales follow the story of Kyoko and Masako, originally the guild friends of the franchise main guys Runio and Kunio, Ricky and Kunio, for one game, mind you, as they battle through hordes of enemies in order to save their boyfriends from their captors. The story of River City Gales River City Gales has an interesting story. There was a clear decision to separate the continuity of the story from its source material, so much so, by the time the game ends, you are hit with what I can only describe as a backhanded slap. That's coming from somebody who didn't even know about the original source material. Let's look at the original version 1 story followed by the updated story with the game's subsequent updates. Vision 1, the original. River City Gales opens with a fantastic cutscene with a heart pounding soundtrack. We are introduced to our primary characters, Misako and Kyoko. The Gales were sent to detention. It's here that we also learn that Kyoko doesn't even go here. Kyoko receives a text message from an unknown number stating that their boyfriends, Ricky and Kunio, have been kidnapped. Misako becomes enraged, insults her teacher, and literally performs a WWE chair attack. This triggers the game to begin, and it triggers my memories of watching WWE. Misako and Kyoko then proceeds to literally break out of school so that they can go and save their boyfriends. This opening tutorial sequence also gives us a deeper look into the characters of Kyoko and Misako and how they generally banter with each other. We learn a couple tidbits here and there that gives us an idea of their friendship and respective personalities. We soon come across Hasabe and Mami. They serve as the arch nemesis for Misako and Kyoko. The girls banter with each other, but it's here that we learn that Hasabe and Mami is, is acting very suspicious. The rivals implies that they are the ones who are Kunio and Ricky. Upon hearing this, Kyoko becomes angry and Miss Sako tries to calm her down. The principal announces over the PA system that the student body should stop Misako and Kyoko from continuing along their journey. When they arrive at the gym, we encounter Misuzu. We learn that she's a part-time security who has been in high school for 7 years and after defeating Misuzu, she points the girls to Crosstown where she saw their boyfriends with someone creepy. She then, and I kid you not, body shames Kyoko and Misako and then, well, listen to this. I'm surprised they'd be interested in a pair of twigs like you two. And that's two on our probably inappropriate checkbox. You are not going to see that for the rest of the video, but whatever. They leave school and Kyoko immediately forgets why they left school in the first place. They then proceed to cross them. The game guides you through the city as you battle a variety of enemies, explore multiple parts of the city, and battle several bosses in the city. The first time you reach the end of the game, you are presented with Sabuko, the daughter of Sabu. She is the current leader of the group of people who don't do illegal activities whatsoever. She is an interesting boss battle, but it was quite a shock to learn that upon defeating her, we are presented with a new game plus option, and it's not the true ending of the game. What? Once you've completed the game a second time and you arrive at Sabuko with the Hasabe and Mami charms, you end up encountering Hasabe. Once you win, you are granted with the origin of Kyoko and Masako. We learn about the time where Kyoko and Masako dated Kunio and Ricky in a 16-bit game that never made it to the US. We also learn that they dated only for that one game. And Ricky and Kunio doesn't even know nor do they care about who Kyoko and Masako are. Kyoko kicks Hasabe and Mami out the window and then we get the same ending as before. Kyoko gets a message on her phone potentially indicating a secret. 
version 1.1, the updated ending. In the updated version, version 1.1, the game sees a new ending which brings it in line across multiple regions and provides new artwork and dialogue. In this version of the ending, the girls land in the spa, encounter Ricky and Kunio, and the boys indicate that they were not kidnapped. They then decide to go on a date to get burgers. That's it. That's the updated ending. Cool. So, 3.c. What? Insert a, a, um, a, bit, a clip of me highlighting 3.c. What? In inverted commas. Okay, in the finish. Thank you. Here's the raw draft of how I felt after completing the game for the second time to receive the version 1 ending. Okay, listen to me. That ending, I was pissed. We played through the entire game twice, and they weren't even dating the people. Not only that, the first time I saw Kunio and Rikyo Sona scene, I figured it was just a consequence of not fighting the true boss of the game, i.e. bad ending. So, that's the canon ending. Why did I save them? They clearly like Hasabe and Mami. What am I even doing? What? I don't know much about River City Ransom, but I figured the devs would have tried at least to make Kunio and Ricky somewhat likable so I would have to, so that I would bother checking out the rest of the franchise. Since yes, this game is part of the River City franchise, I won't be bothering with the other games and I will be waiting for River City Girls too. The updated version 1.1, both in its English and Japanese versions, makes the boys less of assholes. The updated ending also makes the main characters seem less terrible. This time around, I don't really feel that bad. The ending is nice, not exactly what I expected, but it was still nice nevertheless. I am still a bit annoyed that I needed to do the game twice, but the New Game Plus makes the second playthrough worthwhile. Typically, New Game Plus is just for doing things you didn't get to do during the main playthrough and maybe unlocking a few secrets here and there. In this regard, the game makes New Game Plus much more appealing. However, when you take into context the game's story and the other parts of the game where it is implied that Misako and Kyoko are not girlfriends, both versions feel like a bit of a letdown, which is a shame since the rest of the game stands far above for these kinds of beat em up games. The first version makes the girls seem less desperate and outright foolish for going after somebody else's relationship with such violence. The updated version also doesn't really help. Gameplay River City Girls is a side scrolling beat em up brawler game inspired by all those that came before it. You take control of one of two characters initially and you play through the game with that character. When you complete the game for the first time, two additional characters are unlocked for you to mess around with. Each character has a light attack, a heavy attack, a button for jump, and one for a power move. The game allows you to perform different actions based on the location to the enemy. Using a heavy attack facing the enemy will cause the enemy to be thrown, while using a light attack from behind will perform a knockdown attack. Characters can also pick up various objects to use as weapons. These weapons can break after a certain amount of uses, or it can be thrown for range damage. Kyoko Kyoko is an agile character which makes sense given that most of her power moves surround the use of her feet, such as a clear callback to Chun-Li's thousand kicks and a tornado slash drill kick. She also uses a few other neat power moves that revolve around her bashing her enemies with her feet. She also has a dab move that acts as a deflect which is objectively cool. She also has a move which allows her to use her enemies as a springboard. She has a tornado kick which allows her to cover up to the entire screen at times. Overall, she feels floaty but it matches well with not only her personality but the way you are intended to use her in-game. That floaty nature accents her speed quite well. I used Kyoko on my first playthrough because I rather the mobility and agility that she offered over the raw power output of Masak. The little embellishments when Kyoko performs the thousand kick move is great and makes the move set even more satisfying to pull off. Kyoko was my favorite throughout the game. She's a fun, loud, brash character, constantly seesaws between quirky and murder. Masako. I enjoyed playing Masako. She's a very much a brawler style character who values pure power over all else. While I'm sure behind the scenes both characters' movement logic was similar or the same, Masako's moveset was often more about hard hitting and pummeling her enemies. I didn't use Masako much other than to just try the character for the sake of trying the character. The boys, TM. Once you complete the game, you gain access to Riki and Kunio. Both characters play much like their counterparts in Kyoko and Masako. I only play these characters to test what, are, to test what they were capable of, but during my playthrough, I didn't use these characters. They certainly felt more heft in the way that they moved and the way the hits land, but for the most part, they resemble Kyoko and Masako. The game employs several different tactics lifted from the original games, as well as some new tricks to keep the player engaged and active. Every time you defeat an enemy, the enemy drops money and provides experience points. 
each one of your characters has a level 30 cap, which you will need to level up individually if you want all the characters to be the same level. The money that you gain can be used to purchase items from vending machines and stores littered throughout the map. These shops offer items and moves that you spend your money on. Different shops unlock additional moves and items. Among these are the ability to equip each character with specialized items that help the player plan their fight style. From being able to increase damage, make power and health bars fill up faster and some items affect item drops from enemies and vending machines. There's a significant number of special items that you can get either from buying it in stores or getting it off as a boss reward. Games combo system starts you off simple with a 3 button combo that can be extended as you level up and gain access to new moves. The combos can be extended by using directional inputs in conjunction with either light or heavy attacks to chain combos together. Additional moves can be bought in dojos. Each character has their own specific moves that must be purchased separately and as that character. Items This has got to be one of the most more unusual parts about this game, being able to only hold two items at a time seems fairly limited given how specific the bonuses are, at least until you get to the part where you find a hidden shop and basically get a massive boost. Although those items are $5,000 a piece and something I wish I had known easier to amass that amount of money during the playthrough and not have to grind for the 10000 that you would have needed for both items which makes you a tank. The items can be swapped at any point even during boss battles from your pause menu screen. Once you acquire an item it is automatically added so you can simply browse through the items to pick and choose what you would like without any form of inventory management. There are several items that drop throughout gameplay and these items can be used as weapons, from baseball bats to guitars, to items in the environment such as chairs and large wooden boxes. The items in this game are interesting, though they give small bonuses. I'm sure I felt the bonuses working. The game lets you swap these items on the fly, so I imagine the developers intended for you to constantly be switching between items in between boss battles, or just in battles in general. Although in my playthroughs they didn't seem to be as intuitive as they wanted, I often forgot about it in the general playthrough. But once I was in that new game plus mode and grinding away for currency and levels, I found myself constantly swapping items to make the grind less noticeable. The food items in this game also has an interesting mechanic, eating them for the first time would provide a stat boost to one of your stats. I assume you were supposed to get enough money from the playthrough to purchase all of them and use it, so you would get a stat boost in addition to the ones you would gain from leveling up. This did make the game a bit easier or at the very least noticeable. I didn't notice this on my first playthrough and I was almost at the end when I realized that hey, when I eat food I get stat bonuses. Either way, it was an interesting mechanic. Combos You get accustomed to the game's combo system quickly and it allows you to chain together huge sequences for maximum damage. It is also choreographed to you well enough that you know when to stop your combo to either throw, grab, or do something else entirely. Best part about this game was the very expansive combo system and if you got really deep into it, to generate some insane sequences that not only look satisfying to pull off but looks damn good while doing it. Each character has their own movesets which change the way their combos play out. Each combo also carries with it embellishments that train you to keep doing it just because. Grinding. Holy shit, I did not expect this game to be this grindy. I really wanted to complete this game as best as I could, secrets included, but the sheer amount of grinding that would require was staggering. At the time I didn't have time to complete the game to 100%, I do now, obviously. I ultimately just decided to stick with Kyoko as she was my pick in the first round of the game and she was max level by the time I decided I wanted the secret items too. The game scales the enemies every time you defeat a new boss or enter a new area. The non-boss battles were easy enough to get through and I never found myself frustrated when fighting the enemies. I did enjoy wailing on enemies as Kyoko though. However, when it was time to find all the secret statues and other unlockable, the game really slowed down for me personally. I couldn't care to level up the fellas as I simply didn't care. 4B4 Leveling The game is capped off at level 30 for each character. At first you need to level up quickly and then it tapers off. By the time you're about level 20-25, it becomes more of a slug true. By that time you would have ended up in new game plus mood and now you have more than enough time to get to level 30. If you played with the same character, you would probably get level 30 easily. However, if you picked another character, get ready to do it more and longer. 4B5 Quests This game has a form of quests too. Once you begin playing the game, you will come across Gorai, a near and childhood friend to Kyoko and Misako. He regularly gives you quests throughout the game, 
he may have you perform fetch quests for him or go randomly beat up some Yakuza members. Once these quests are completed, you are awarded experience points and money. For B6, friends. Throughout your playthroughs, upon beating an enemy hard enough, you can recruit the enemy to play for you. They'll be activated by a button press and they'll usually jump into the screen and perform an attack of some kind, which could work as a screen clear or an area of an effect attack. You can recruit almost every single common enemy. It would have been cool if you defeated bosses under certain conditions that they could be recruited to. In the new game plus, that would have been a great feature. As the system is now, it lets you pick from a variety of enemies, each with their own unique attack. While it would be nice if you hit the ones you wanted for as long as you like, the characters you recruit have a 3 hit maximum. If they get hit 3 times, they will die and you will have to recruit a new one. 4C Will Mechanics Despite being a 2D side-scrolling game, River City Girls employs a great deal of exploration. The developers crafted a well thought out pool. Each map is interconnected very seamlessly. It really does feel like an entire town. The game also includes things such as buses to really incorporate the notion that you're traveling off to a far off part of the city. However, this comes at a price. The massive 2D world has you backtracking several times throughout the game's run. 4C1 Exploration I do commend the exploration in this game. While it takes you most of the map as you do your first playthrough, it is in your second playthrough that you're going to be visiting all the locations on the map. Your map is always accessible when you open the pause menu. It's integrated into your phone UI of the menu which makes the map stand out. And having it always tell you where you've been and where you've yet to go is a great touch that makes exploration much easier. You'll end up in a sprawling nightlife part of the city, places where the downtrodden exists, a ship quite a lot more. The game keeps the exploration fresh by having multiple different locations that really pop and has so much charm and individuality that it feels great to just walk around in. Whenever you come across a new part of your map, the girls would often quip about it, giving you a sense of the world you're supposed to be inhabiting. Sometimes it's something simple, other times it tells you that you shouldn't be in this place. Different parts of the map also might be different times of day. Some streets are available at night time, um, the school and main towns are available in daytime and others are uh, like the area leading up to the beach and the pier is often in dusk. This is a great way to keep the game visually interesting and I enjoy seeing different styles of pixel art in the background. 4C2 Backtracking There's a significant amount of backtracking in this game. It isn't overwhelming but the fact that you end up having to redo the entire game I would count as backtracking. Whether it's doing quests for good eye or just trying to get to your next objective, you'll end up having to walk through several areas you've already been in. This isn't too bad as the game keeps the action up. Backtracking also allows you to find new areas that you might have missed before and it may take you to the location of a Sabu statue which is needed to acquire the true ending. 4D Boss Battles uh, What is a beat em up game without some challenging bosses to beat you down? River City Girls excel in this department as each one of the their bosses are unique and challenging in multiple ways. There's one boss who I despise, but I'll get to him soon. Um, each boss has their own gimmick that informs how you'll go about defeating them. It isn't at all any different from any other game that you fight bosses. Here, however, the game makes it a point and purpose not only to give each boss their own personality, but also ensures each boss's mechanic is wholly different from what you've seen before. The game ramps up the difficulty of bosses a bit inconsistently, but it evens out by the mid-game. Each boss, except for one, was mechanically sound and fun to play. Every boss was so unique in their own style and presentation that they all made for a good fun experience. Each every boss was so unique in their style and presentation that they all made for a fun experience to just watch. For the I, Misuzu. Misuzu is the first boss you encounter in the game. She is the guard of the school and she's a decent introduction into how boss battle battles works in River City Girls. She isn't all too difficult once you get a handle on her abilities. Truthfully, there isn't much to say about the Misuzu fight. Yamada Who the fuck designed Yamada? Yamada, even on normal difficulty and on my second playthrough was an absolute nightmare to fight. I had less trouble with the final boss than I had with Yamada. His hitboxes are way too large, multiple unblockable hit combos, and way too much randomization of his abilities. He has three different randomized attacks, none of which choreograph well, and to top it all off, his stage has an actual hazard that costs you a significant percentage of your health. Yamada has several attacks where the hitboxes are these huge boxes 
that even extend to the back of him. The only way I was able to beat him was banging my head against a wall until I got lucky. No other boss in this game had this much luck in defeating them. It felt downright unfair. When I lost to other bosses, I know I messed up. Either I didn't have enough items or I mistimed my combos. Yamada was downright unfair and I absolutely hate him and his pathetic backstory. Seriously, fuck that dude. Hibari. Hibari is a fashion designer in River City Guilds. Hibari's boss battle was an interesting battle, an unusual cross between a Mega Man style boss and a bullet hell boss. Hibari would often shoot hundreds of purple charged balls towards your character as you attempt to dodge it and put her back in her own path, which she then hurts herself and you get to then lay damage onto her. She would also shoot out a sword which you can guide via trajectory to hit her. Hibari was a fair boss. Everything had a pattern to it and it was satisfying memorizing the patterns and then dodging it. This was a great boss battle, not too unfair, the right amount of randomization and when it failed it was my fault no doubt. Also this battle team gave me some real Toho vibes, I loved it. <laughs> Hibari's three phases were in interesting, fun and engaging. Abobo is a guest character from the Double Dragon series. He wasn't too hard, but he wasn't too interesting. His hitboxes were a tad bit annoying though. It took me a few tries to beat him in normal, and then a couple tries as Masako in normal plus. All in all, it was a bit uneventful. Noise. Well, that's weird. <laughs> Noise was hinted at various points from the beginning of the game, much like Abobo. However, Noise is way cooler than I expected. Her character design, her backstory, while a trope, was cool and the fact that Noise's music is a part of the game's soundtrack is cool. As for her boss battle, she had some annoying patterns. One of her battle phases is a Guitar Hero style sequence where you have to dodge the notes as they descend from the top of the dance floor. Another phase, her fans jump the security barriers and attempt to kill you because you're fighting Noise. The boss battle was fun though it took quite a lot since the Guitar Hero section took me out way too many times. Sabuko was amazing. Her design, her skill set, her difficulty all fits well with her characterization of the top Yakuza in the city. She's a fantastic ending boss for the first playthrough with a huge array of dazzling moves and unlike the other bosses she has one more phase rather than the standard tree. Also Sabuko's anime style intro is fantastic. Sabuko has several movesets such as teleportation, she uses a sword, Multiple times during the fight, she would call out her grunts to help her boost down your health. You'll have to contend with her using these different medallions slash charms found in the background which she uses to accent her base moveset making the fight more challenging. When you kill Sabuko for the first time, when she loses her 3 bars of health and the game slows down and she recovers an entire health bar, what a rush. Her moveset increases, she has more aggressive attacks and heightened damage. Ultimately, while a difficult battle on your first playthrough, the battle was fun and engaging with a thunderous soundtrack that really kept you going. The only way to access the game's final true boss is by breaking all the Sabu statues and then equipping the Hasabe and Mami charms in your inventory slot. Once you've done that and walk into the game's final boss battle, you'll get an introduction for Hasabe and Mami and Masako and Kyoko makes a quip about Sabuko being the final boss, kicking her through the window. Hasabe and Mami insults the girls and the fight begins. This was underwhelming. Having spent the entire game bashing my head against annoying boss battles, creepy boss battles, super cool boss battles, metal boss battles, and even the best fake ending boss battle in the game, Hasabe and Mami was woefully underwhelming. I know I'm not one to criticize, but I can't help but feel far empty at this game's ending than when I started. I guess the developers wanted you to just win as quickly as possible since you did slog through the game twice at this point, looking at every nook and cranny trying to find the Sabu statues to even end up at the game's real ending. With a max level Kyoko and a bunch of items I was able to take down Hasabe and Mami in one battle. No restarts, nothing. I just played the boss battle the first time and crushed them. Again, this is probably more because you've been slugging through the game, so here's a win. The fact that we ended up with the same ending also left a bad taste in my mouth. Overall, the boss battle was fun, there were some interesting ideas here, and even if I only played through this battle once,
probably haven't seen all their moves. It was decent, a few cool things happened here and there. The banter between the characters was nice, the synergy between Hasabe and Mami was great, although I wish they offered more of a challenge seeing as they were the final true boss. But it was fine given the circumstances, I understand. 5. Aesthetic River City Girls is stunning. Constantly barraging you with a variety of colors, intricate and expressive pixel art that just exudes charm from every aspect. The sound, art, aesthetic all combine to form a unique, intriguing experience that makes the game stand out from its contemporaries. There's a lot to talk about in the overall design of River City Girls, but I'll be focusing on what I think are some of the core elements that often pushes it over the edge. Music. Overall, the music and sound design are so masterfully put together that it's hard not to get hyped from the moment you start up this game. A thundering opening theme song sets the pace for the game and it never stops. Every aspect of the game's sound design lean into the overall old school aesthetic that blends 8-bit chiptune style with much more grandiose productions. Sound design and FX. The reason I'm calling out the sound design and FX is the fact that behind the, multi, the multiple densely layered soundtrack, each sound effect pops. From the moment you push the pause button or you enter a new area, it's not just that the game reduces the volume of the music, but it accentuates the background music while also being sonically distinct from, an, from it, ensuring that you don't miss the callout that you need to hear. The menu clicks, the item pop-ups, the select screen, all wonderfully immersed. I can't help but feel like I'm playing a beat-em-up game from long ago, but better. As you explore various stages and enter boss battles, the game quickly changes up background music to match the environment you are in. There are times when you're in a mall and the music reflects a more pop, happy-go-lucky style, while at other points the game features a dull, dragon soundtrack that helps keep tension up. There are several times where the background music has vocals in it, and even though this can be distracting, I found it often added to the law of the world around it, particularly in nighttime street sections. The background music made it seem like you were walking through a late night lively street. 5A3 Boss Battles This is where the game's music really stands out to me. Every single boss battle had its own unique boss theme track. The music of each boss battle complements the nature of the boss battles. Hibari's boss music is very fast paced and often reminiscent of old bullet hell games, which is fitting since a few times a boss battle devolves into a bullet hell game. Noise is another great example of this. She's a rock star in universe. Her boss battle music not only features her vocals, especially when she's singing, but there are also clear influence from punk rock plays throughout the soundtrack that really sells the image of Noise being a rock star. The mini guitar solos, which plays alongside, also helps a ton since her weapon of choice is her guitar. Tabaco's battle music is pure boss music. The entirety of the song is laced with the strenuous, constantly building synth that keeps climbing, carrying the tension of the battle with it. It's a tension that can be felt even when listening to the song without playing the game. Main Game Team I'm surprised this isn't more popular. It beautifully explains the game's premise without feeling like an exposition dump, even though it is. The punk rock inspired soundtrack really gets your blood pumping right from the get go. It keeps the vocal melody in the background of the soundtrack as the vocals ends and continues to carry it forward. It's not often that we get a full punk rock or any rock metal despite Doom 2016's success, most video games opt for EDM or orchestral as their main themes. The song perfectly matches the aesthetic of River City Girls and the girls' general punk rock attitude that carries with them throughout the game. The art in River City Girls is a vibrant display. Every single choice of color palette in this game just makes every single character pop and stand out no matter where they are in game. Every enemy was detailed and unique, though you end up fighting the same group of enemies in the region. Each boss battle was unique in every way. Their designs were easily recognizable and genuinely wonderful. Even their stages were designed in such a way that obviously complemented the way you were supposed to battle them. Each character was able to stand out in front of diverse backgrounds, all of which were so meticulously constructed from the school of the opening stage all the way to the dark neon clad streets. This is an absolute testament to the artists working on this game. Each background was always so vibrant and rich in detail that it was so much fun just running around and exploring the scene. There was always something going on in the background. I can sit here and spend hours talking about how beautifully crafted this world is. The care put into the world design that seamlessly transitioned between sections made moving from section to section so smooth and fluid. 
The game features a colorful cast of background characters that always provide a sense of living in this small world. <laughs> What's next for River City Girls? River City Girls 2. It got announced in the Tokyo Game Show 2021. There was a small gameplay trailer that showed off what seems to be the same engine running a new polished wheel, with potentially Ricky and Kunio playable from the start. Either way, I'm looking forward to playing this sequel. 7. Conclusion River City Girls is simultaneously a love letter to the old school beat em ups and the franchise which spawned it, while also being easily one of the best modern 2D beat em ups around. The game's fluid fight mechanics, gorgeous pixel art, and thumping soundtrack makes River City Girls a titan in the field. Anyone who values 2D side scroll and beat em ups needs to play River City Girls. There you have it. That was my review for River City Girls. Um, I'm staring at the audition file right now. It's almost an hour long. That's pretty fucking insane. So thanks everybody for making it through the River City Girls review. I really did enjoy this game. I am a big fan of this franchise now. Thanks for watching. I'm very grateful that you made it all the way through. And I hope that you gain something from this. So if you do it, if you did enjoy this game, or if, if I missed anything, if I didn't talk about something that you think I should have talked about in this game, please leave it in the comments below. Tell me any other games I should check out that is similar to this. I really do like um beat em up games, but I don't really get an opportunity to play as much of them because I can't really find them half the time. There's a written version of this video essay on my site, voidzeromedia.com. There's a newsletter there you can subscribe to weekly video game news you know the hottest topics every week Sun on sunday you'll get an email with all the cool stuff that happened for the week so plus there is a community i'm building over there so if you'd like to join that i'd be happy to have you all and also i have a few other things in store so please check the description i may have a discord up sometime i don't know it happens Thank you for taking the time to watch on this video, to comment on this video, to like this video. You know, it always helps me out. Thanks for um, getting subscribed. There's way more to come. Thank you very much. Next up is the Cyberpunk 2077 video. I hope to see you all around. The void calls, will you answer?